Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for um joining the webinar. I'm just going to uh, wait a few more seconds um, because people are still joining uh, the webinar. Um, so I'll begin sort of formal introductions and, and welcoming everyone um, in, in just a few seconds as folks are, are coming in. Well, I just want to thank everyone once again for um, joining us this morning. We are so excited um, to hold this conversation on um, El Salvador's recent presidential election. So just to introduce myself, my name is Jenny La Gonzalez. And I'm an assistant professor of public policy at uh, Harvard, Harvard Kennedy School. And I wanted to just uh, begin with a few uh, housekeeping announcements before introducing our um, incredible panelists. So first, uh, the Ash Center, which is the sponsor of this webinar today, uh, acknowledges the land on which Harvard University sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. Um, and we were also recognize the continuing president presence of the neighboring Wampanoag and Nipmuc nations. Um, one more housekeeping um, bit, it, our discussion today is being recorded um, and you will receive a link to that recording um, via email after the conclusion of today's um, discussion. And you'll also be able to find it on the YouTube channel of the Ash Center. Um, we're also going to, um, we've got about an hour for today's discussion and we'll reserve the last 20 minutes or so to respond to questions from the audience. If you do have any questions uh, over the course of the conversation, please feel free to submit it via the Q&A button um, that you'll see at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, now, without further ado, uh, I wanted to just introduce our fantastic uh, guest speakers that are going to sort of help us make sense of um, everything that's going on in El Salvador right now. So first, uh, we'll hear from uh, Jose Miguel Cruz, who is the current director of research at Florida International University's Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center. He's an expert in the area of criminal violence, gangs, police, democratization, and public opinion in Latin America. Um, and uh, Dr. Cruz has a PhD in political science awarded by Vanderbilt University, as well as a master's in public policy uh, from Oxford University and a BA in psychology from the Universidad Centroamericana. Uh, and we were just saying this before we got on air. Uh, actually, Jose Miguel Cruz is like the godfather of the study of Salvadoran gangs. So um, the, the, that bio understates um, just um, his vast expertise in the subject matter of, of, uh, of that concerns us today. So um, another incredible expert that we're, we'll be also joined by today is uh, Dr. Manisha Gelman, who is an uh, associate professor of political science at Emerson College. Uh, her research um, interests include comparative democratization, cultural resilience, memory politics, and education policy in the global South, as well as the United States. Dr. Gelman is also the founder and the director of the Emerson Pr Prison Initiative, which makes college um, available to incarcerated students at Massachusetts correct Correctional Institution um, in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, which is, sorry, which is a men's medium security prison. Dr. Gelman serves as, as an expert witness in asylum hearings in U.S. immigration courts regarding country, country conditions and violence in El Salvador and Mexico. So today's event, um, just one last um, tidbit for everybody, is a part of a global elections webinar series that is sponsored by the Ash Center um, for Democratic Governance and Innovation, as well as the Rajawali Foundation Institute for Asia, both uh, centers within the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, the kind of impetus for this uh, webinar series is the fact that over half of the world's population is going to or has already elected new leaders in 2024. Um, and so we really want to, are, are working together with experts from all over the world to make sense of this momentous year um, for democracy, um, inviting various scholars from Harvard and from other institutions to examine these elections um, and the electoral trends uh, from, from around the world. So this is just one of, of many exciting um, conversations about elections that we'll be holding um, throughout the year. So uh, Miguel, Manisha, I want to jump right in and um, and discuss with you a little bit about what we've been observing in El Salvador. Um, and maybe just for folks who are maybe less familiar with the Salvadoran context, um, I'd love to hear from, from each of you kind of about um, what is your diagnosis of the kind of pre-Bukele, um, I should mention Nayib Bukele, the president of El Salvador, for those um, who don't know, what have been the conditions that have led to um, this really radical um, 
and in many ways um, transformative figure in, in El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, who has seemed to have uh, ushered in historic um, cha uh, historic drops in, in homicidal violence in particular in El Salvador, uh, but while also concentrating power in a way that many of us, you know, characterize as, um, as an authoritarian turn in El Salvador. Um, so I'd love to hear from each of you sort of what you view as the kind of pre-Bukele pre conditions um, that kind of gave way to, to his rise in El Salvador. Um, and maybe we'll start um, with Miguel and then we'll hear from Manisha. Well, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Yanilda, uh, Professor Gonzalez, for, for the invitation and also to the Ash Center for the opportunity to have this discussion uh, uh, with you and Manisha. Uh, this is a, it, it's a, it's a, uh, I'm honored to be, to be here sharing this, this, these ideas uh, with you discussing sort of the, the situation in El Salvador. To go right into to try to answer your question, I will say there are three. I will put three conditions. I will say three things about the 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 contextual factors that explain the right the, the rise of Bukele. Right. Uh, the the first one, I think, is important to remember that El Salvador uh, um, is coming from a transition from uh, military rule in the early 1990s. Uh, uh through a peace accord that ended up a civil war in in El Salvador right and that supposed in was supposed to transform the political landscape uh, in the country right and 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 especially to bring peace to the population right El Salvador went through a civil war of more than a decade right and 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 the peace accords were seeing not only the opportunity to democratize the country, Right, which was important, but also to bring peace to the to the population, right, and and to, and, and to the country. Actually, the, the peace accords were effective in terms of uh, reducing or basically stopping political violence, right. But because of the conditions, uh, so many other different conditions, including some more economic reforms and. And, and the lack of really um, a, a interest from the elites to transform the conditions of the population, basically we have the we have the appearance of criminal violence in a way, you know, in a, in a very very significant way. Uh, that led to also to to the uh, to the uh, expansion of youth gangs. Uh, which at some point became, you know, uh, very fa infamous and famous uh, to some extent, uh, MS-13 and 18 Street Gang. And, and, and that was seen uh, for most of the population uh, as, you know, as, as if peace hadn't re really arrived in El Salvador. Basically, Salvadorians went from suffering um, from political violence to criminal violence. And I think that's uh, uh, another condition that is important to mention. Uh, to a point in which people were exhausted, tired, because uh, I, uh, at some point El Salvador reached really, really uh, endemic levels of, of violence, right? We're talking about homicide rates of 100, homicides per 100,000 people, which were the highest in the region in 2015, right? Uh, and, and basically that set up, I think, the conditions for the, 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 or the, the apparition, let's say, let's use that word, of a, of a populist leader dealing with, with crime. Um, I have to say, uh, that's something that took some time to reach those levels of violence, but in the public conscious, people were tired. So that's an important element. And the, and the other element I will mention is also the fact that um, the, the, the political system and the, and, the, and the party system in El Salvador at some point uh, was seen as unable to respond to the needs of the population in terms of security. Also in terms, in economic terms, 
but especially in terms of security. And I, in, 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 and I think in this uh, played an important role, the fact that after the PISA course, right, we have a, a, a country ruled by um, ARENA, which was in some way the same people, the same elites who had been ruling the country before. Uh, and they ruled the country for 15 years. They were democratically elected for basically 15 years. But then when the FMLN came to power in 2009, many, many people view that, uh, saw that as an opportunity to, to have a change, uh, finally have a change in the country, right? Um, and, and the FMLN wasn't up to the task, I have to say, in terms of basically this is the period in which even levels of violence even increase more. And people saw that uh, based on many surveys and my own research, um, people saw that as a, in some way as a betrayal of what the FMLN has promised, right? To bring uh, changes, to be profound changes in the country, transformation in the country. And basically this opened the opportunity for the apparition of, of an alternative. I have to say, based on, the, and, and I'll, I'll finish with this, uh, based on, on, on my own research with surveys, I mean, that sort of um, sympathy for a populist leader uh, wasn't new. It was always there in the, in the political culture. It was always there. But after the Civil War and after the Peace Accords, basically, we have a very stable political party system, ARENA on one side, the FMLN on the other side, that prevented the apparition of a, of a populist leader. Uh, what happened is now we know now that Nayib Bukele basically used one of these parties, the FMLN, basically to start his political career. And basically he was able to read the conditions and to present himself as a, uh, as a, as, as a, a different kind of political animal separate from the FMLN, despite, despite that he... He started his career as, as, a, as a member of the FMLN, and he presented himself as an outsider from the political system and used this, this uh, frustration, uh, people's frustration toward the political system, basically to, to, to attract support for his, um, for, for his candidacy and basically race to power. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that um, broader context, Miguel, about um, a two-party system that had for many years, um, you know, uh, prevented the emergence of a populist um, leader, but that nevertheless um, perhaps was not able to channel correctly, uh, make people's demands for improved security that opened the pathway for um, such a populist um, leader. Um, Manisha, I'd love to bring you in as well here and sort of think about your work is, is rooted in uh, civil society, social movements, um, rights, citizenship. How do you view kind of this pre-Bukele context um, that, you know, maybe laid the foundations for the emergence of, of a figure like Bukele? Yeah, thank you. And just to say as well, it's such an honor to be in conversation with the two of you. And also just appreciating that in the participants, there are many Salvadoran experts as well. So it's very humbling to offer my own analysis in, in front of so many people that know this case uh, as well or better than I do. Um, I in my in both my scholarly writing and some of my journalistic writing, as well as in the the country conditions reports that I offer in immigration court. Uh, there's a couple of themes that I look look to highlight around why the culture of violence continues, why the, the context of violence continues in the country. And as Miguel was talking about the transition from the Civil War to the post-war period, the, the misnomer or the nomenclature of a post-conflict or a post-war process, uh, for me, it stands out because El Salvador went from active civil war context to what is now a better better understood and documented uh, context of 
the criminaliza criminalization and gang situation in East LA, in the California in the 80s and 90s, the arrest, uh, incarceration, and then deportation of those folks uh, to El Salvador. Many of them had come as very young children to the United States fleeing the war. And then they brought with them the infrastructure of El Salvador's uh, major gangs back to, to El Salvador when they were deported. And that post-war context of the country then joined with this de this deportation cycle of sending people who, you know, had joined gangs for a variety of reasons, including economic security, including uh, a sense of social identity and belonging, uh, to back to a country that, you know, where for a variety of reasons, replicating that social mechanism of gang infrastructure provided a sense of, of safety and some, some particular type of well-being for people replicating gang structures. That meant that in this post-conflict so-called uh, period, there, there really wasn't a deep reckoning with the culture of impunity <laughs> because war impunity translated then to gang impunity. Um, many people, including some of the participants here, have written and spoken about the way that the amnesty laws in El Salvador have operated to reinforce that culture of impunity so that the culture of violence uh, became cultures of violences in a way that that has perpetuated for decades. And that culture of impunity, in, in my analysis, rests on the underlying drivers of conflict in the first place not being addressed. So as, a, as an analyst of conflict, I look at unequal access to insufficient resources as a major underlying driver of conflict <laughs> across El Salvador, but in many other places, including in, in uh, the United States and some of the communities that I do research on in the US. So un unequal access to insufficient resources has perpetuated over time. The That was happening in the 1800s in El Salvador. That was happening in the lead up to the 1932 Matanza. That was happening in the lead up to the Civil War. And that is happening now. So this, these continual underlying drivers of conflict have not been addressed. I was a very hopeful graduate student in 2009 doing research in El Salvador when the FMLN won the presidency for the, for the first time. And I remember the discourse being like, now El Salvador has consolidated its democracy. <laughs> And this real hope, this deep hope among yeah. folks that I was hanging out with, that this was going to signal some sort of shift. And I think that the procedural importance of that shift and of the sub subsequent Sanchez Sedan presidency is important to acknowledge, like that change of power is really important. But if the change of power is not coupled with addressing those underlying drivers of conflict, it doesn't actually change the framework for how people experience daily life, which has been in a situation of human insecurity in the lead up to Bukele's uh, first election. Thank you so much for um, for that um, additional broader context, uh, Manisha, because I think that that you're right that it's not we're not just sort of talking about criminal violence. Sort of, um, you know, uh, Miguel mentioned that political violence was sort of re replaced by. Um, criminal violence, but the, the criminal violence is driven by sort of a broader pattern of structural violence of other um, forms of inequalities that sort of fed onto um, those ongoing patterns of of violence. Um, I'd love to hear um, from from both of you now, sort of um, your own assessment of Bukele's model and and kind of what he has accomplished. Right? We've seen the headlines uh, of of you know mass incarceration of these dramatic declines in homicide rates right from going from one of the uh you know uh, homicide uh, uh one of the most um the, the countries with highest homicide rates in the world to to you know some of the lowest rates in Latin America um and so um how you understand um give us a little bit more context about your understanding your assessment of Bukele's model um and what has been what you see as some of its uh, per primary impacts um, maybe this time we'll, we'll go back to Miguel for this one, and then back to Manisha. Thanks, Janet. I just wanted to before before answering your 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 question, I just want to say I completely agree with what Manisha has said, especially on the line of impunity. I think it is very hard. Uh, it is very hard to underestate uh, the uh, oh, oh, sorry overstate the the. the the importance of impunity in this and the continuity that impuni of impunity 
in the in the cycle, uh, you know, before the um, before the peace accords, during the peace accords, after the peace accords, and the 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 what is happening right now because impunity basically allowed many of these um, uh, 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 actors from the past. Uh, re remaining in the structure in the institutional in the institutions and government is uh, structures to remain basically doing what they have been doing right uh and 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 I think uh the fact is that those the same people who well, some of them some of those who violated human rights in the past right managed to survive to maneuver to stay in institutions and we see some of them even right now cooperating with the Bukele model, right? Even after 30 years, right? Still there and, and sort of, you know, passing and transmitting these ways of, of, of understanding the, 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 the exercise of power from, from, from the government. So I think that's an important point. And, and to, to, to respond to your question, I will say in terms of, uh, what is the Bukele model? Um, I would say that in addition to what all we know, uh, courtesy of the same of, of Bukele himself and the government of the propaganda machine of Bukele, I think it's important to to point to two other elements of of, of his model. First, uh, I think uh, this model rests on the absolute concentration of power right uh, and, and 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 i think that plays a role in the sense that in some way the bukele model is a sort of evolution from the mano dura of 20 years ago right uh, he basically has implemented something that uh that in el salvador we have tried before um, now, the difference with the Mano Dura of 20 years ago is that 20 years ago, when Flores, with, with President Flores, uh, attempted this uh, in 2003, we still have a sort of system of checks and balances in the country, which Bukele has now completely destroyed because he basically controlled the Assembly, the Congress, control the Supreme Court and the justice system in a, in, a, in, in a complete way, an absolute way. And that basically allows him to uh, enact these, you know, these laws and these, uh, 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 these provisions that put anybody in prison without seeing a judge for 15 days. And then when they come, to, when they see them, uh, uh, they have to see it in mass, in, in a group, and when it's impossible to individualize any any responsibility and and keep people in prison uh, unfairly for for years now at this point and many other years. So so that concentration of power allows him to have almost uh, the exercise of power of a of a of an absolutist leader, right, in which. Uh, fear starts creeping up in the country in which, you know, the police and the military have absolute power to do uh, with people whatever they want to do. That's an important element that I think is usually underestimated in the international discussions about the Mukele model. And the second one, which even is even more important in my view uh, in terms of the Bukele model as it is, is the fact that the, the the apparent success of Bukele not only has to do with the with the draconian measures with the mano dura, but also has to do with the fact that he has been negotiating with the gang leaders in El Salvador, right? So, and, and this is something that we don't know outside those who study this issue, and especially don't know outside the country. The fact is that in order to avoid a backlash from the gangs, right, and from the criminal groups, he has been negotiating with the leaders of those gang groups, uh, or those groups, basically giving them benefits, 
taking them out of prison, sending them out of the country, right, in order to avoid any conflict in the streets. And that's the other part that explains the apparent success of the Bukele model. Thank yeah, you. For that. I, oh, sorry. Um, just just a brief um transition, right? That that this is something that is is not as well known, right? Sort of, and, and certainly is not publicized very much within the international community, right? When this model is talked about being exported, which we'll get to in a second, is the underlying um preceding process to sort of mass incarceration, which was this negotiation with gangs, um, uh, in the way that 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 you've discussed, um, Miguel. So thank you for providing sort of that broader um information about what the model consists of. Um, Manisha, I know that that you think a lot about this question of um, how do we actually characterize and evaluate this this now what is um, being uh, characterized as sort of now now this is a safe um, country, but I know that you raise a lot of questions about uh, sort of who that safety is is for. So I'd love to hear some of your um, reflections on this point. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I and thank you for holding space for this because I, it's just so important to have real talk about what the model is projecting in terms of its international facade and what actually the daily experience of of people in living the model is so the the projected image of the Bukele model is one where gang control has been broken and people are safe now and they are playing soccer in places that they previously could not go and it is a win-win for everyone that the bad guys are in jail and the good guys are able to live their lives it, that is, I'm not going to say that's 100% false, right? There are some people in El Salvador who definitely are having increased experiences of a safer environment to move around in. So I, I want to acknowledge that, that that's true, but that the qualitative experience of increased safety is coming at the cost of human rights and civil liberties for a segment of the population. And so the Bukele model looks like this very, as Miguel said, this absolute concentration of power that rests on the use of police and military arrests of anyone that anyone chooses to denounce as being gang affiliated. So of the 70,000 plus people who have been incarcerated just in the last two years under the state of exception, which is adding to the 30,000 people previously incarcerated in El Salvador, making it over 100,000 people in the state currently incarcerated, um, which is close to 2% of the population. So it's, it, El Salvador has become the highest incarcerating uh, percentage-wise country in the world, overtaking the US, which I had never thought I would say. Um, it, the This fundamental fact that anyone can be denounced without corroborating ever evidence, without proof, means that there are tens of thousands of people who are not guilty of any format form of gang affiliation in Salvadoran prisons right now. And so the Bukele model includes not just incarcerating, to be clear, but incarcerating in a way that cuts people off from their families, from their communities, in a way that has not been done before in the country. So pre-state of exception, pre-March 27th, 2022, People who were incarcerated had access to mail with, you know, mail exchange with family, phone calls, visitation, the, the standard package of, of what it means to be incarcerated. Like there's still a connection to the outside world um, in, in under the state of exception that is taken away. So people are incarcerated and there is there is no communication. I don't want to say no absolute no communication because there is still a black market for cell phone access that's happening where, you know, I certainly heard those stories in my most recent uh, trip there where it's, if you if you can pay enough, there's still access. But for the majority of people, there's no access to communication with family, with outside community. Um, and this and the lack of basic human needs in terms of sanitation and food is is really intense. So we know there have been over 100 deaths in the prison. Those are just the ones that have been formally documented. We know that people have been, the pe handful of people who've been released have been in really critical physical conditions, showing signs of abuse, and uh, abuse torture, lack of nutrition, lack of sanitation, all of that. Um, in my journalistic writings that I did after this most recent trip there in December, January of this past year, I write a lot about the security trade-off. So yes, there's increased security for some because the population is generally 
al allowing the mistreatment of the segment that is incarcerated or connected to people who are incarcerated. Because for families who have someone incarcerated, they are expected to financially contribute to that person's survival. And I did interviews with folks who talked about needing to pay between $100 to $300 per month to send packets to their family members incarcerated. And the minimum wage in El Salvador is $365 a month. So the economic burden that that incarceration places on families, in addition to the emotional and social uh, uh, trauma that it causes is really intense. So there's there's more I could say, but the, I just, I wanna be really clear that the model that is presented as being so functional and bringing security rests on the, the extreme abuse of a portion of the population. Um, thank you for that, um, Manisha, because I think that this is a trade-off that is so often um, presented, right, uh, in, in so many different contexts, from sort of the United States post-9-11 uh, to, to countries facing um, high levels of criminal violence, that you have to give up some amount of freedom, civil liberties, human rights, in order to have safety. Um, and so it's really important to sort of grapple with that as a central element of how we understand what's happening in, in, in El Salvador today. Um, so I want to open it up to some of the questions from the audience, which um, in many, um, the sort of the majority of them right now, people are heated up. Um, they're really thinking a lot about um, a the spread of this model to other countries, and and they're sort of pushing us to kind of think about well, we have to be honest about the fact that violence has decreased, um, and that has happened alongside uh, um, um, this sort of um, authoritarian right suspension of of the rule of law essentially right through the state of exception that um, Manisha was was mentioning and so uh, folks are really hungry to hear from um, from you both about um, what would you say to people in other countries who are looking at this as an as uh, as an attractive alternative and is there a way to have achieved these reductions in violence without the suspension of democratic uh, 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 institutions like through through something like a state of exception. Um, so folks are, are are mentioning examples from Colombia, uh, Argentina, um, you know where some of these models have become attractive. Certainly, we've taught uh, Ecuador, um, and and Bukele himself has even said, you know, give me the authority and I'll go fix Haiti, um, right? So this is definitely a model that um, a lot of people want to see taken to other parts of the region, and so people are kind of uh, pushing us to. Um, to really respond, you know, for the 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 uh, magnitude of the reduction in homicides that we've seen, and is there a way to achieve this without sacrificing democracy, as has occurred in El Salvador? Um, maybe we'll keep going uh, with the um, the order that we've been doing. So, uh, Miguel, um, and then we'll hear from Manisha. Yeah, that's that's a that's a a great point of discussion. Because usually, uh, when 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 we have these discussions about exporting the Bukele model to other countries, uh, in that discussion we usually ignore the fact that the particularities about El Salvador, right? And 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 let me uh, let me explain the particularities of El Salvador that allow this model to be somewhat or, or uh, uh, apparently successful. First. Um, what the, uh, first and and that's why this is so important. First, the point of negotiating with the gang leaders makes a huge different big difference because basically, with that, Bukele avoided the the backlash or any kind of of war in the streets with gangs. Having said this, let me just remind our our uh, our our audience that in El Salvador, the criminal landscape was basically controlled by two gangs, two street gangs, MS-13 and the 18th Street Gang. And, and in contrast with what happens with in many other countries in El Salvador, right, these two gangs basically were very, very, were very well structured in a way that once you co-op the leadership, once you call the leaders which are in prison or were in prison, right, they had the possibility to control everything what happened in the streets, right? And these are just two guns. In a country which is the size of almost a municipality in any other of the big countries in, in the Americas, right? The El Salvador is a tiny country. It's a 21 
thousand square kilometers, which means that is a very small country, and and with two predominant criminal groups, right, which are control, which control everything that happens in in the country. That's not the situation in Colombia. That's not the situation in Argentina. That's not even the situation in Ecuador, right? In which you have first. You, these are larger countries, right? Way, way larger than El Salvador. Second, you have many different criminal organizations. So even if the president, even if those presidents decided to, to, to negotiate with those groups, right? He or she will have to negotiate with so many different leaderships. And as soon as he does that, we'll have another criminal groups entering sort of the dynamics of violence, something like what we see in Mexico to some extent, right? So it is impossible to think that, you know, to that we can replicate this model because in many other countries, we don't have one or two criminal groups. We have many, right, with many different leaderships. And in addition, right, we, in most of those cases, in most of those cases, not all, but we, we don't have leaders that are willing to negotiate and to give to these leaders everything that Bukele has done ha, has given to the leaders in, in 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 El Salvador. So that's an important difference, I think. Yeah, that's an important reminder, right? That sort of once you get the bravado of uh, Bukele saying, you know, I can fix Haiti, right? We have to sort of think about the 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 each local context, right? That it's not. You can't just take sort of one uh, policy approach and move it to another country and expect it to have the same impact. That's always um, uh, an important um, reminder. Um, Manisha, and then folks continue to press us on this question. So I'll ask a reformulation of it uh, in in a few minutes. So Manisha. Yeah, so I, I just have to say really clearly that I do not think the Bukele model should be exported to other countries, though it may provide a superficial immediate band-aid and, and an increased sense of immediate security for some people, it does not rest on a sustainable foundation that will allow the democratic functionality of a state to continue because it, it, it is resting on an assumption of consolidation of power in an individual in a non-democratic way, which has happened in El Salvador. So El Salvador is the democratic backsliding is so extreme, people are rightfully asking, and eventually what happens when he is voted out of office? Eventually what happens when gang those gang members come out of the prisons? Because the underlying drivers of violence in the first place have not been addressed. So it's not an exportable model. And it's also really important to keep in mind that many people are not safer under this, under the state of exception. And so in my writings, which I put in the chat, although it looked a little messy, there some of the writings look at the security trade-off where in the ab in communities that had previously been tightly controlled by gangs and the those gang members have been incarcerated, now police and military personnel have stepped in to control those communities in ways very comparable to how gangs were controlling them before. So I did interviews with people who described Previously, they had to pay an, extor an extortion fee to gang members. Now they were having to pay that extortion fee to police. Previously, they were worried about their daughters or their sisters be being uh, taken as gang girlfriends. Now they are. Now there are soldiers or police coming into people's homes uh, because they have the right to do that under the state of exception, identifying the young woman that they want to to go with them. And saying to the parents, if you don't let me take your daughter, I'm going to denounce you or I'm going to say that this neighbor denounced you. And so the uh, experience of physical safety as for young women in some of these communities, for uh, for working class families predominantly, is not necessarily one of increased safety. For middle and upper class, for the Uber drivers, for people who previously had really explicit uh, experiences of vulnerability to gangs, yes, there is that increased feeling of safety, but the way that police and military personnel have stepped into the power vacuum to now be extorting, kidnapping, committing uh, crimes of sexual violence 
is, is not being told enough, in part because people are terrified that if they speak up and if they denounce the police officer that raped them, they will be denounced as being gang affiliated and incarcerated. And that has happened enough times in enough communities that people know it's true. And so they stay silent. So we don't have the data showing the way that that new framework of violence is uh, is taking place. In addition, and it's not it's not well confirmed by me at this point, but you know, people were talking about the way that the Zetas are the Mexican cartel is moving in to fill some of the spaces where previously MS-13 and Barrio 18 we're operating. So this immediate Band-Aid model of security does not rest on a, a democratic foundation that is sustainable over the long term. And we have to find other ways across these countries, Haiti, Colombia, all the places people are mentioning in the chat. How do we address the underlying drivers of violence in those spaces and not go for what appears to be a quick fix solution? And let me put, Janilda, I'm sorry, to, uh, let me put this in the broader context of the discussion between, you know, a political system and democracy and, and, and security, right? That is, uh, many of the questions, uh, uh, you know, are in, in that precisely, you know, um, uh, a point to that sort of debate, right? And, and let me just remember our audience that basically what we know from, 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 from the scholarship is that those countries who are safe, usually, uh, in terms of uh, when when we look at the relationship between political system and, and security, um, the safer countries are either very democratic countries in which there is full respect for the uh, for the rule of law, or completely authoritarian and and, and the uh, authorita authoritarian and absolutist uh, systems, right? So those are the safest type of societies. Either you have full, full democracy or you have dictatorship, right? The, you don't... You don't hear about you know crime in North Korea. You don't hear about crime in 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 dictatorships. Why? Because of the absolute power of the government, right? The, usually, the, the the problem of security rises in those countries, societies that are struggling to have you know democracy, uh, some kind of democracy, but with very deficient rule of law. Right, which has been the case in, and it is the case in in most of in most of Latin America. What Bukele is doing is taking the Salvadoran society not toward democracy to fix security, but toward complete uh, uh, autocracy to fix security. Right, and he's basically saying, and sometimes he says that in a very public way. He says that. Well, in order to do that, I must have absolute power and the military and the security forces must have absolute power to dispose of the people however they want in order, in order to be safe. And I think that's an acceptable trade-off, right? That's an acceptable trade-off because as Nisha has, 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 has said and so many different human rights organizations have documented, there's a high cost for that, right? Uh, so absolutely, we cannot agree, I think, in, in, in moral terms, to a model of security in which basically your life depends on the absolute power of the government, right? So uh, now, is there a way out of, is a, a way of security under democracy? There is, right? But it takes time. And it takes time and it takes, it takes a lot of, uh, 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 ethical sort of commitment and 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 and, and bravery in, in order to do that, right? It takes time. The, the The problem is that many of our most of our politicians are not willing willing to be patient of that and deliver to the population the rights that the that the, the rights to the population in order to have a full citizenship and full rule of law. Um. Thank you so much for um, for sort of reminding us about um, sort of the spectrum, right? That that exists in terms of, and that that cr high crime, particularly in the Latin American context, right, sort of emerges with democratization, um, and that sort of that that struggle to sort of consolidate democracy, create um, you know strong capacity states, democratic institutions, uh, has come 
um, in the midst of or sort of facing that challenge of increased crime. And that has been the predominant un undelivered promise, right, of so many Latin American democracies. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. And I, I think people are, again, the comments uh, and the and the Q&A is, is really heating up with people really pushing us to um, address a real um, problem, which is the, 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 the real, the most important demand that most Latin American citizens are bringing, which is this um, the personal security, right, as a predominant, not only right, uh, of course, uh, uh, one, the, you know, one of the most important human rights, um, but also one for which they are perhaps willing to sacrifice, or they at least express that they are willing to sacrifice other rights, or perhaps abstract principles such as democratic norms, um, right? I think that one of the um, one of my students, um, I just read his um, thesis, his um, master's thesis on on this subject, and um, one of the people that he interviewed, um, you know, shout out to Jeremy Giles, uh, my uh, our, our student at HKS. Um, one of his interviewees said, you know, the challenge that we face is that in the past we were able to say mano dura didn't work, um, and now we're facing the challenge of uh, a mano dura policy that seems to be working, uh, and we need to be able to right, we need to be able to to come to terms with that and sort of offer what is what is the alternative. Um, so in the in you know the the time that I had left have left, I wanted to just get us to kind of unpack, right? So first, slogans like mano dura, plan de control territorial, right? These are all things that are uh, uh, um, sort of very good discursive um, elements that sort of convince a large segment of the population that you just have to give uh, you know one leader authoritarian control and then they can get everything in order, right? That seems a very uh, to be a very appealing thing. But is there a way for kind of us to kind of break down the policy, break down the elements of what has been done and kind of see, is there a way to achieve a, the same or similar result while preserving democratic institutions, right? And I think that this is really like uh, folks that are observing from Colombia, from Ecuador, from Haiti uh, are really thinking about, is there a way that we can have that security uh, without sacrificing democratic institutions, those sort of pillars of society that one of the participants from Haiti had sort of mentioned. Um, and so maybe in the time that we have left, I'd love to hear sort of from each of you, um, what are the elements of this policy that um, could be taken and, and um, used in a democratic context without having to go full blown um, states of exception? Because one thing that I'll just remind our um, participants, uh, my my students analysis of homicide data in El Salvador, the, the decline in, in, in homicide rates um, were happening since 2016. Um, and even Bukele's first years in office before the Estado de Excepción saw these declines in homicide. Um, and so we shouldn't take the state of exception as this silver bullet that from one day to the next produced um, this outcome, right? This too took a lot of time. Um, and so I think we shouldn't um, let ourselves be kind of swayed or enamored by this sort of flashy slogans or, um, you know, the the kind of temptation of uh, one, you know, single person being able to solve these problems from one day to the next. Um, so yeah, so it's just turning it over to, to kind of each of you. What have been the um, the elements of of a that we can say um, these are practices that that could have perhaps contributed to the reduction in homicide, and they do not require us to sacrifice um, democratic norms. I mean, I will also say I think that um, your point, Jose Miguel, because this has come up in a couple of the comments. Um, it's very problematic to sort of say we can sacrifice the rights of certain and the lives of certain part of certain citizens for the safety of others, right? This is where a lot of my work lies. And so I think um, we we don't have to actually make that trade off uh, for safety. And so I, I, I think it's important to kind of just state that. Um, so um, maybe we'll hear first um, from Manisha and then um, we'll um, give the, the last word to, to Jose Miguel. Yeah, Manisha. Sure. Yeah. And I just want to appreciate all of the questions and comments coming through the q and I mean, I, I, I wish that we had longer to talk about this. And just to say, I'm happy to stay in conversation with people that are interested in doing so, because this is what I'm thinking about a lot of the time. <laughs> um, so in my other hat that I wear, I run a college and prison program. And I think a lot about the role of the carceral state or the role of the prison system as a tool for public safety. And uh, in that program, in the Emerson Prison Initiative, we bring a bachelor's degree pathway for people who are incarcerated in Massachusetts. And so I'm pretty immersed in the literature on the role of incarceration and what it what it means to do different kinds of interventions in prison. So locking people up in totally dehumanizing contexts uh, doesn't produce <laughs> citizens that want to come out and pay their taxes and be good neighbors, right? We know that when people have access to resources 
in prison to to change their life circumstances, that often that is a really powerful uh, intervention. So in the United States, people generally recidivate or return to prison about 50% of the time within three years of being incarcerated. Uh, for people who have access to education, those numbers drop precipitously down to between one and 4% for folks who earn a college degree. So there's lots of things that we can be doing in carceral space to address some of those underlying drivers of conflict, for example, that are not happening, where the opposite of that is happening in El Salvador, where the most dehumanizing conditions are uh, uh, producing people who are wildly angry at the state and and uh, entrenched in further within gang cultures that are part of the only way they're able to eat, for example, if they're if they're inside. So that's not a functional model. Um, I think we have to look at toxic masculinity and the way that uh, that gender norms are operating in places like El Salvador. A lot of the expert witnessing I do is uh, on gender based violence. And so the, the perpetuation of uh, assumptions about gender and the way that gender norms operate continue to be something that contributes to a culture of violence against uh, against female identified people in the state. And I really I think that that is obviously not a Salvadoran problem. That is a that is a problem in many parts of the world, including in the United States. But looking at how do we actually do culture change in a way that will that will address uh, th that part of the story is one. It's one contributing factor. Um, I, I also just want to address the opinion polls and the, if I can, very briefly, the the popularity because. Again, I think that it's there's this sense of, oh, Bukele is so wildly popular. He declared the state of exception at a time when the opinion polls show that UCA opinion polling organization shows that his popularity was was dropping precipitously and at one of its his lowest points since he was elected. So there's a really logical political analyst story as to why he would declare the state of exception and take the measures that he did at that moment with really declining popularity. And then the fact that he, you know, he was polling really high in popularity, he got 83% of the vote. Again, only half of eligible Salvadoran voters voted for him. So these in the, the way that numbers are used, the way that data is used can create a, a impression of like everyone loves him. I did a bunch of interviews in January leading up to the election where people were saying, well, yeah, I'm going to vote for him because, you know, the other candidates aren't going to win and it wasn't better under them. That doesn't mean I agree with his policies, but it's it's like you know the best of the best of bad options. So I just caution folks in looking to opinion polls and these high popularity ratings. Not these are not signals of total agreement with what the state of exception looks like. These are people trapped in difficult voting circumstances, which some of us here in the U.S. might be familiar with, um, where there there are not good options, and we may hold our nose and vote for someone uh, in a in a certain way. So there's a lot there's a lot more to say on this in terms of the sustainability of the model. Again, if Bukele does not make himself president for life, what does what does the Bukele model look like five years from now or 10 years from now or 15 years from now? And I think in in my heart of hearts and as someone who studies minority politics as as my focus, we can't be comfortable with security for some at the ex at such a clear expense of others. It just that is not a functional model for society. It may feel functional now for people who are benefiting. But as I write about the person who is so uh, excited to not be extorted one day is the person whose partner or grandson or daughter is incarcerated the next and is denouncing this, you know, denouncing the state of exception where it previously felt like a benefit. And the line between those roles, particularly for working class people in the country, is just really thin. Thanks. Let, let's 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 de let's de deconstru deconstruct. I'm sorry. Um, you know the the Bukele model in terms of you know what he is doing. Uh, um, let's ignore for a, for a moment the fact that he had he has negotiated with gangs, right? But let's focus on the on the draconian part, right? And let this what the, let's basically analyze what he's doing. He's putting. Every everyone who seems to be a gang member, right, and that means any young male poor from marginalized communities, put in prison, right? That 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 he can do. So, in the suburb we have right now, more than more than seventy thousand people in prison, right? Most of them young males, 
right? So this model in order to function must keep that amount of people in prison forever, right? Um, and, and in order to continue functioning in the same, he, the model must keep you know, arresting and capturing more and more people in those systems, right? At the same time in which the Salvadoran government is not making, uh, uh, is not increasing investment in education and social services and social programs. It's increasing invest, uh, the budgets in security forces. That's what he's doing, right? That's the reality right now. Now, considering that the structural factors of violence, crime uh, in El Salvador are still there. And because of the poor economic performance of this country, right, is most likely is the, those factors are going to basically deepen in the next years with, with uh, more people mm, joining the employment age without opportunities, without, you know, uh, quality education, right? While at the same time you have 70,000 people in prison, right? 24 seven. And we know from the, from the scholarship, we know that the cradle of crime and organized crime are prisons. So you think that that model is sustainable, right? That model is not sustainable at all. I mean, at all. I mean, because the government will have to redirect most of its money to keep these growing apparatus of security, of imprisonment, while at the same time is not investing in education, in social programs. So what we're going to see, uh, unfortunately, is that when it's not longer sustainable and it's not longer politically, you know, useful, because at some point it will stop being useful politically in terms of, in terms of elections, that model will crumble. It will, it will crumble bad, right? And remember me, please, when that happens, because I'm telling you that's going to happen in El Salvador. And this based on what we all have studied not only in El Salvador, but in Latin America. So it's unsustainable completely. And it's sustainable and it will be, it will make things worse. And just to finish, I, and, and in response to, to one question in the, in the chat, right, whether we have lived under terrorism. I grew up in El Salvador. When the war started, I was 12 years old. And when the war ended, I was 24 years old. So I spent my my young years on at war, right, with the authoritarian government, in which if you were walking in this down the streets and the military saw you, most likely you 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 will be put down, sometimes sent to prison or just disappear. And we live on fear, right? And that was the war. Then because of of impunity that Manisha has taught. We still have lived in impunity for other actors. So, so I know what it, terrorism is. I know what violence is, right? Because I saw many, so many different, you know, bodies in the street during the war and after the war. So I know what I'm talking about. And I'm, I know that in the, to the extent that we keep ignoring, uh, you know, those factors that have produced impunity, chronic impunity in the country will still have violence in El Salvador unless, unless we start really uh, uh, preoccupying about the rights of the, of the Salvadorians. Thank you so much for, um, for that uh, set of reflections, um, Jose Miguel, to, to kind of think about that continuity of violence, right? And that it's not a, a hypothetical, um, it's not a hypothetical question. I think that there's still a lot of um, desire in the comments, right, to to kind of address this question. And this is not one that, uh, you know, we're out of time, unfortunately, for this particular iteration. But I think that this is going to be an ongoing um, conversation because the problem is not going to um, is not going to go away. Um, I know that sort of within um, HKS, we're going to continue to have different types of conversations um, around uh, the issue of sort of how do you create a democratic 
a security model from the basis of democratic principles. So please be on the lookout for um, for those events and those conversations. Um, but I just want to thank um, Manisha, uh, M Professor Manisha Gelman, Professor Jose Miguel Cruz for joining us for this important conversation. I want to thank everybody who's in the audience um, and that has raised the really difficult questions because this is the question uh, really for Latin American democracies in particular. Um, right, is this sort of what, how do you produce safety for people that is necessary for people to live their ordinary everyday lives um, and exercise their other, their other rights while also preserving uh, democratic principles such as the rule of law um, and, and, and checks and balances. We don't actually have to make that trade off. Uh, and I think that our challenge as scholars, our, uh, the challenge of democratic practitioners will be to sort of demonstrate results um, to the population um, on, on that front. Um, so I wanna just uh, a huge thank you to everybody for participating in this conversation to be continued. Um, and um, and just, you know, it, it's, it's not an easy, there are no easy answers. So even those of you that are saying in the comments, uh, you know, these are terrorists and we just gotta incarcerate them. That's not, a, that's not, that's not the right answer either because uh, El Salvador did that for a very long time and, uh, without results, right? So we have to um, really look, um, um, at, at this particular puzzle of El Salvador with a lot more detail and a lot more attention, which again, uh, we're gonna be um, starting to do um, at various moments within the, the Kennedy School. Um, so with all that um, said, thank you all very much. Uh, please join us for our subsequent um, Global Democracy um, 2024 elections um, series. And um, everybody enjoy um, the rest of your uh, weekend and happy Good Friday and Easter to those of you who celebrate. Um, thank you, everyone.